Right, well, here we are. I'm Matt Linet, and welcome to uh, Zero to Full Stack App, Episode 2. Here we're going to do, go by example, the first three actual coding uh, demonstrations besides Hello World. Values, variables, and constants. But before I go into that, I need to let you know the license that go by example is licensed under. This work is copyright Mark McGranahan and licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 unported license, as is uh, the Go Gopher, uh, which is that little that little doodad that looks like a gopher. And that means that you are free to share, adapt, giving appropriate credit. I'm not making any changes to this code besides what you see me typing here in the Emacs and here in the Go Playground. So you will see very clearly what goes from Go by example and what goes here. Now that we've dealt with the licensing thing here in episode two, I will be including the license in subsequent episodes, but not going through it point by point. It'll be just linked in the description below. So what are values in programming. Here we have the go by example code and it begins. Go has various value types including strings, integers, floats, booleans, etc. Here are a few basic examples. Ooh, it seems like here we're missing a curly bracket. So we have our normal package main import format, our main function. And we're doing format.println go lang. So if we begin package main import format function main. And here we'll have format.println go plus lang. What do we think will happen there? If we run it, we go and we see, oh, go lang. No spaces, no anything weird, it just evaluates to go lang. So here we have this value here, go, and this value lang, when added together, turn into another value, go lang. And this this particular value here, if I go and I format dot print line go lang, this value go lang has the type string. So a string is just an interpretation of zeros and ones that let us programmers know and any uh, compilers and anything having to do with teasing out the code exactly what kind of things go into these blocks of memory. Uh, otherwise, it would just be runes um, or ASCII characters or things that um, that don't actually have any meaning outside of how we interpret them. Because we just get a big, huge string of zeros and ones, then we don't know what to do with them. So we're running print go plus lang and print go lang. This expression here, go plus lang, evaluates to the value go lang. If we do our other uh, printing, format.println, and we have the string 1 plus 1 equals, and then 1 plus 1, then we know, if we format this, run this, we get 1 plus 1 equals 2. And it already knows here, this format.println knows, I didn't put a space here after the equal sign. If you look carefully, I didn't put a space there. But still, here in the uh, place where it evaluates, you can see that it did already put the space after the equal sign, so that's really cool. But then this expression, 1 plus 1, evaluated to the value 2, and print line took that value 2 and turned it into type string in order to add to 1 plus 1 equals. 
I know that might seem a little complicated, but if we continue with some more examples, I'm sure you'll get how it works. Uh, we get format.println 7.0 divided by 3.0 equals then 7.0 divided by 3.0. And we can then run this. And what do we get? We get 2.3333333. Five. Now why would we have that rather than just 2.33 going on to eternity? Well, this has to do with a different data type. This 2 is an integer type. And this 2.33555 is a float type. And if you try to represent this number using only binary digits, using only the digits 0 and 1, you can't actually do it. And so you get to the point where you're cramming all these 1s and zeros in order into the piece of memory that represents this 2.333, whatever. And all of a sudden, you're stuck either with like a 0 or a 5 or something along those lines. You don't get to keep that 3. So that's a limitation to working with the inbuilt float type. There also is the Boolean type. And those are the ones that you learn in Boolean algebra. So if we do format.println, and we can just do true and false equals true and false. We'll format that. Makes it look prettier. True and false equals false. So if we don't understand Boolean logic, the way it basically goes is you would have a true statement and a false statement. And if you use the word and in between them, then so, so let's say it is true that I am 30 years old. It is false that I am 31 years old. So if I say I am 30 and I am 31, you know that is false. And so that kind of a, an expression will evaluate to false. Now, if I do format.println true or false equals true or false, we're going to get something different. So if we'll take our true statement, I am 30, our false statement, I am 31, and I would say, I am 30 or I am 31. Well, that's true. And so hopefully when we run our Golang program, it will show us that true or false equals true. So We'll take our another um, true statement and negate it. Do format.println not true equals, and we can already line up our equal sign there so it looks pretty. Not true. Uh, put that parenthesis there, format it, and run it. Say not true equals false. So if we have not true, uh, so we'll take our true statement, I am 30 years old, then I am not 30 years old. That's false. And so that's an example of uh, Boolean uh, values. So if we take all the values uh, available here, now we have strings, integers, floats, and booleans, we can do a whole lot with, with just those types and just those kinds of values. But it's often unwieldy to deal with all these expressions combined, and so sometimes it's nice to give them names. Um, now, I'll admit that this next example, this variables example, is quite contrived, but we can still go and do and do something with it. So if we go and we empty our, our main function and we put something else in, let's go and say uh, our var a equals initial. And we format.println dot print 
line. And I can do initial value of A. A. Format it. Run it. And it says initial value of A. Initial. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, then they're probably going to do something else because you can technically go and say um, A equals final. And we say format dot print line final value of A. A. Format it, run it. And the final value of A is then final, not initial. So a variable can be set to multiple things. It's a, sp a, a variable in the idea of Golang is a spot in memory that holds a bunch of zeros and ones that hopefully ha to us have some sort of a meaning. So this variable A initially held the, the, the string initial and now it holds the string final. You can declare multiple uh, variables at the same time, like here. So you have var, b, and c, and we can say these are of type int, so these are integers, equals 1 and 2. And we format dot print line. You say b equals b, c equals c. format it, run it, and we can say b equals 1, c equals 2. So they are exactly what we assigned them to. And if we decide to go and say b, c equals 3, 4, and then copy paste this line, we'll probably need to format it again, and run our code again. Now that we've set it to 3 and 4, we have b equals 1, c equals 2, and then we print again b equals 3, c equals 4. So what goes into these variables can be different at different points in time. And that's kind of important to know as, um, as we program. A go can infer the type of initialized variables? Yes. So if we print line uh, true, it'll basically print line true. So we do it like this. Format, run, and we'll find that indeed true evaluates to true. variables declared without a corresponding initialization are zero valued. Okay, so that's different than how things are done in C. In C, if you declare a variable and you give it a type, but you don't say it equals this thing, it could be whatever garbage happens to be in that memory spot. But if you're declaring a variable in Golang, well, it works like this. var e of type int format dot print line e. I'll say to e equals e. Format that, run that, and we have e equals zero. So if we go and we initialize a variable e as type int, and we print it out, it's not going to say gobbledygook, and it's not going to say null. It will actually be zero. This is just the kind of behavior that we need to know about when we're dealing with a language. Of course, it's better practice to just go say var e int equals zero. That way we're being very clear about what's happening. If we don't want to do this declaration variable equals, you can actually do f colon equals. That's the assignment operator, apple. If we format dot print line.
line. Uh, we'll do F equals F. And I'll show you a little something that breaks or that works wrong. F equals apple. So if we decide to do F e assign pair and format dot print line F equals F, what do you think will happen? Just gone and assigned apple to F. Now we're assigning pair to F. We'll run. Our go build failed here on line 24. And the reason our go build failed was because this is the way we assign the string apple to a new variable f. We don't have a new variable f because we've already made a variable f at this point. So if we just do assigning the string pair to f, however, it should work just fine. Format that, run that, and f does indeed then become pair. So the point is uh, you can only ever initialize and assign a variable once. If you're going to reassign something, you have to use the equal sign instead of the colon equals. So that's all for the uh, go by example lesson on variables. Finally, we deal with constants, which are actually quite nice because if you declare something as const in Golang, then you can't change it. Uh, we had two imports here. We had format and math. That'll make it nice. We'll format this. I need to, oops, I need to go close that string there. Format it. Oopsies, we didn't use it, so it got rid of it. Well, import format. We'll just leave that for now as import format. Const s string equals constant. Oh, we're actually putting that outside the main. Okay, that's fine. We'll just place it here. Const s string equals constant. Format that. Get that out of the way. Ah. Format dot print line s. So the way this works is we are saying that there is a constant. We give the name s. It is of type string. And this is the what we're putting into that particular spot. So if we there it already did our imports for us. Very nice. Format up print line s. If we declare another constant, const n equals five zero 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 zero. I actually think that it was. I can't recall whether it's in GoLang, but you can actually do this in some languages, so that you can uh, keep track of zeros more easily. I might be mistaken, so we can try this out and you can see me be a dingly doof if it doesn't work. Const d equals 3 times 10 to the 20th divided by n. Format dot print line d equals oops, d. Now I can format and run. Yes, it actually did work. So that was something that we didn't have in the go by example lesson, but it's it's absolutely annoying to try to read numbers without um, having them be delimited like this. So it's nice to be able to see, okay, 1,000, 100,000, like 500 million. So 3 times 10 to the 20 divided by that is 6 times 10 to the 11th. But it's not being assigned a, a um, type. So if we format dot print line 
I type int 64 D so we're converting D into a something of type int 64 and int 64 just means that there are 64 zeros and ones going to represent this value D so if we decide to print this up we get 6 times 10 to the 11th 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 so 6 so 6 followed by 11 zeros uh, before that it was just keeping it 6 times 10 to the 11th if we decide we wanted to um format dot print line math dot sign n I wonder what happens if we try to run this in the go playground oh, it imports format n math for us already that's very nice and then we hit run and we get uh, minus 0 0.28470407322 so uh, when you're dealing with signs of numbers uh, it's the trigonometric sign so if you don't know trigonometry uh, I recommend just going and looking up what is a sign of a number uh, a sign of a number is um, the uh, if you if you take a triangle and you have your hypotenuse going this way you have your y-axis going this way and your x-axis going that way you have this little angle here in between the horizontal and your hypotenuse this sign of the angle is this vertical value divided by the length of the hypotenuse and so that means that uh, this uh, 500 million radians is going around the circle many many times and actually um, it's either having a negative radius distance or a negative y-axis so it's either down here uh, the angles either down here in this quadrant or it's up here in this quadrant um, but that's 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 neither here nor there it, we don't actually care too much about math.sign at this point but the point is that we are getting a float value out of this um, and this math.sign of n is expecting n to be a float we didn't go and say const n float equals 500 million but it's being inferred to be that kind of a type because you try to cram it into the box of sign so if you try to do other things to it rather than cramming it into a bunch of different boxes you or, or cramming it into a bunch of different kinds of boxes you can run into trouble so that's just an important thing to know an important thing to realize and really if all of this seems like garbage to you don't worry because you'll eventually get familiar with the idea of putting values into places in memory because that is in large part what Golang is all about and what writing more complex programs is all about so in summary what we have done is we have talked about values we have talked about putting those values into locations in memory with names and declaring um, via the const declaration that those points in memory cannot change and just to prove to you that we can try assigning something else to n so if n was 500 million we can do n equals 3 in our program and what's going to happen we run it cannot assign to n untyped int constant 500 million untyped int constant 500 million so once you have something over you're going to say d equals 4 run that cannot assign to n cannot assign to d because here on lines 13 and 14 we have already assigned to them and it might seem clunky 
oh, I just wanted to change the value of n. But really, having the practice of making many things constant allows us to reason about things because we don't have to worry about what's in any given place in memory at any given time. In other words, we're making our programs easier to, real, to reason about when it comes to time. We might lose a bit of performance gains here or there, but what we lose there we gain in the ability to reason and write less buggy code. Now, this might not mean anything to you given that this is a an intro course, but I will tell you that uh, const is your friend. And when you're writing things, being able to go and give something a name and say that it's constant, it gives you the assurance that whenever you decide to use n, you're going to get 500 million, or every time you use d, you're going to get 3 times instead of the 20 divided by n. Or whatever it might be in your program. Whenever you use s in this program, it will be constant. It's not going to be variable. It's not going to be a, b, c, d, e, f. It will be constant because that's what you declared it to be on line 8. Next time, we will deal with the for loop, the if-else statement, and switch statements. Switch statements themselves are very interesting. Different programmers have different opinions on the matter of using them. I like them, as long as we don't let them get horribly unyieldy and confusing. So, until next time.